Well, I have the pleasure this morning to introduce Ben Dickey this morning. He's going to come and minister. Brother Ben, would you come sure. to the body? Okay. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Now you get to see the face. Some of you just heard his voice yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Yeah, I'm the DJ turn preacher. Thank you, everybody. I, uh, I'm just grateful. I, uh, I also am that person who sees a squirrel, and I was so impressed. Wes, you killed it playing one-handed and taking communion. Like, you know that you are a great musician when you can just play the piano and take communion with one hand. So, uh, grateful. So, yeah, I'm super grateful to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Monica and everybody, uh, everybody here at Highland. I've been coming here. I looked up on Facebook uh, memories uh, I think 2013, glad we got Monica here. Uh, the We had the Memphis crew. Uh, for some of you longtime Highland folks, we would bring all kinds of stuff from Memphis. And uh, gosh, man, it was just, this this whole community has blessed me in ways that I'll, I'll never uh, be able to fully repay. And uh, I remember, and you'll hear my story, I'm just really here to, sh to share my story about overcoming addiction and and what God's done in my life, but I will tell you, I came to this community many, many years ago, uh, and took, and took, and did not leave, uh, I was that person on, on Spring River that did not leave it the way I found it, let's put it that way, and, uh, I apologize for that, uh, so now I get to come back, and, uh, hopefully share a little bit of hope, so I will tell you that I, uh, I grew up Cumberland Presbyterian, I'm grateful for a, a very loving grandmother uh, and a very loving father and, and a very loving community. My entire community were all my aunts and uncles, and my aunts and uncles still go to that church, uh, and it's it's where I got my foundation, uh, and it's probably, it's the biggest reason I'm still alive today, let's be real. I uh, We're also, you know, Cumberland Presbyterian, so, you know, we carry the TV when we're worshiping, if y'all know what I'm talking about. We don't 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 raise your hands too high, um, or we just keep our hands on the pew. That's pretty much what we did, gripping gripping it deathly. Uh, just kidding. I uh, but I did. I grew up in the church, and I'm grateful for that. But I will tell you, in uh, in my early teens, I uh, I walked away from God. I walked away from God in every way possible, every way that I could possibly do it, I turned my back. But he, he never turned his back on me. And, uh, and I'm here to tell you, you know, when you're down to nothing, God's up to something every single time. And I, um, like I said, I'm grateful for that upbringing. It wasn't enough. I, uh, I started, you know, experimenting with all the stuff. I'm not going to mention all the specific drugs of choices and all that. I mean, whatever you had, I'd do it. But there were a couple of, of, of drugs, alcohol and, and some others that, that really took me down through there and took me, almost took me out. Um, but I can remember towards the end of my addiction, and I'm getting to that point where now I've been, I've been clean and sober longer than I was uh, out there. Does that make sense? So anybody in recovery? So <clears throat> I got a I got an app that does the math. If you want to know, it's I've been clean and sober for fourteen point two eight years, one hundred seventy one point three eight months, five thousand two hundred seventeen days, one hundred twenty five thousand one hundred ninety five hours. <laughs> Wait a minute. But who's counting, right? I mean, it's, it's no big deal. Um, but yeah, so April 25th, let me just start in with April. Let's, let's go back a couple of months before April. Um, guys, I, I remember toward the end of my addiction, I was, I was searching. I was searching for something. I was searching for, uh, I was just, I, I was searching for God. And I remember that childhood home church, I actually, I actually tried to go back a few times and I was under the influence, and um, 
Are y'all a welcoming church? What if somebody right? What if somebody walked in here right now drunk? What would you do? Think. Just don't tell me. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Don't tell me, but think about that. If you can't walk in here with all your burdens, where can you go? Where do you go? I mean, you can walk into my treatment center. I'll tell you all about that in a minute. But, guys, I needed something. I needed to hear God's voice. I, there, was a, there was a TV preacher. I would get home. I was a nightclub DJ at the time, and I would get home from the club, and I would turn on a certain TV preacher. He's in Texas. People had their opinions about him. He's motivational and maybe smiles a lot. But anyway, um, <clears throat> I was searching for anything, anything positive, anything godly, but I could not hear God talking to me because I was still, my brain was just so under the influence that I just couldn't hear it. And I would walk into my childhood home church, and I tried so hard. Uh, preacher was amazing, but I just, I just could not hear God talking to me. And that was the last couple of months of my addiction. And, and then April 25th, 2009, God showed up. Uh, God showed up in the, form of the, uh, in the form of the Tipton County Sheriff's Department, the 25th Drug Task Force, and the DEA. Um, they, they knocked on my door. Well, they didn't knock, uh, actually. I wasn't there. <laughs> I, was, I was at the club. But um, they, uh, they came on in there. And my sister and her boyfriend, we were all doing things we weren't supposed to be doing. And, uh, and that's the night that, that God saved my life. That was God, right? Um, and I look back, and it was, it was literally the day that God saved my life. I had a childhood friend. He came to the club that night to get me. Uh, he was a cop at the time. We had been friends since kindergarten. He showed up. He said, Ben, I got something to tell you. He said, drug, drug enforcement agency, everybody's at your house. Uh, they found, uh, it was meth. They found a meth lab and, and all kinds of stuff. And so I was like, well, okay, glad I'm not there. <laughs> I was like, well, that's not how that works. Um, so <clears throat> I, uh, I go to the house. And, guys, I, I need to tell you, this house is my childhood home. Uh, it's the house I grew up in. It's two houses down from my late grandmother. My grandfather was a huge cotton farmer, so all that, all those houses around that were my family. And uh, to top that hill and see the the blue lights and the and the fire department and and the just everything going on, it was it was overwhelming and heartbreaking. And uh, I'm the reason that my father no longer owns that property, uh, but he's got his kids. He's got both of his kids actually. Me and my sister both are, are clean and sober now. So. Um, and yeah, so I mean, he, you know, he's got his gifts, but it's hard. You know, it's hard when that's your childhood home. But it was, uh, it was literally what it took. You know, I remember bragging. Don't, don't ever brag that just. Oh, I haven't been in trouble. I must not have a problem. Don't say that out loud. You know, uh, and and I can remember praying. I was praying to God. God, please help me. And sometimes God, God helps us in ways that, man, God, you could have made that a little bit easier, right? But uh. But it took what it took, and I, I went to jail for the first time in my life. Uh, turns out living in a house where something's going on, even though you may not be doing it, that's still against the law. Um, it's a, actually a felony. And so I get out. I get out of, uh, well, I'm sitting in jail, and, I, and I'm just absolutely crushed. I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, but I get out a couple of days later, and I'm sitting in a house, uh, my dad didn't even live in his own house anymore, but he paid the bills and, like, did all the stuff, enabled uh, a lot. And, but I'm sitting in this house after I'd gotten out of jail, and I'm just depressed, and I become suicidal. Uh, I just did not want to live anymore. And, but God, right? Every single time, every single time, when I, what did I say a while ago? When you're down to nothing, God is up to something. And I see a figure walk by the window. I hear a knock at the door. And uh, I open it, and it's my older brother who I hadn't seen in a few years. Anybody who's lived in addiction, you guys know the, the ones that we love the most. That's not the folks that we want to see. God bless all you folks who've got somebody struggling right now. 
I see some faces out there. I know uh, addiction does not discriminate. It affects every single family sitting in this room, I promise you. You may not know it yet now, but it does. It affects so much, and it especially affects rural rural communities, I know. Um, but he comes, he, he opens the door, or I open the door, and I see his face, and I, you know, I break down. We go outside, and we're just standing there, and he said, man, what do you need? You know, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, brother. And then I said the three words that every single person. So I, I work now in the treatment center uh, field. I actually have helped put people in treatment. There's three words that I need every single one of those people to say. I need help. As soon as I said those words, I mean, not even a minute later, my brother's phone rings. And this is once again where God did, did for me what I could not do for myself. And <clears throat> um, the, the person on the other end of the line is a friend of my brother's. They talk maybe once a month. I'm, I don't know. You know, they're friends, but not like everyday friends. And he said, man, I'm so glad you called. He was actually calling my brother for some other reason. But he said, I'm glad you called. I've got my brother here. He needs help. And I know this guy who, who was on the phone, he had been through a similar situation. He had a cocaine addiction. He went to treatment. And he now went and speaks at a treatment center. And so that treatment center uh, was called Harbor House. It's in South Memphis, by the way. So uh, I'll get to that in a second. So anyway, um, I, he puts me on the phone with this guy. I talk to him. He says, man, I, I tell him again, I said, I need help. I don't know what to do. He says, okay, I'll, I'll call you back in two minutes. So he hangs up the phone and calls back two minutes. He says, okay, be in Memphis tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. So I'm from a rural town in Coving, uh, outside of Memphis, about an hour outside of Memphis. Um, the stories you hear about Memphis, they're pretty true. It's, it's, it's pretty rough, <laughs> but I love it. It's my community. It's where my church is. Um, you know, I make the best of it. I did get my my new uh, gun stolen out of my truck the other day. Broke my heart, but, you know, they needed it more than I did, I guess. Um, but so he, uh, and I said, I was just grateful. I remember being grateful, absolutely scared. Uh, anybody, uh, well, never mind. I, uh, I was nervous. I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, I was certainly, I certainly didn't have, like I said, I didn't have God, y'all. I, I need to back up. I, every single situation in my life, the, the, the really bad stuff happened when I walked away from God. All of it. When I'm with God, mm, I got some bad days. Oh, stomp my toe. Oh, no. I got God. You know, not, I mean, maybe that's not a great analogy, but you know what I'm talking about. When God is with me, the bad stuff, it just seems, it, it's hard, you know, bills, all that stuff. That stuff's hard. But, man, there's nothing, there's nothing like hopelessness. That's hard. Despair, you know, depression because you just can't stop. You can't stop doing this stuff. That's hard. And I had nobody. I had nobody to pray to. Well, I did, but I didn't know it. I didn't know that he was still there. Couldn't feel him, couldn't hear him. He literally was protecting my life the whole time. As I put myself in some very dangerous uh, positions with doing that stuff. Uh, and he kept me alive. And so, anyway, by this time, my dad had showed up at the house. And uh, my brother said, well, I'm fixing to take him to treatment. He said, I didn't have any clothes, didn't have anything. My house, my actually my childhood home was wrapped in police tape. The police uh, said they couldn't go back there. They quarantined it or whatever. And uh, and so I didn't have anything. And so my dad was like, well, you need some clothes. I was like, yeah, I need some clothes. So he is funny, but he pulls out 200 bucks. He said, and I'm so glad he did not give me that $200 because I probably would have never made it to treatment, but whatever. Uh, my brother took me to, to get some clothes. Uh, and the next morning, the next morning, I, I show up at Harbor House in South Memphis. And uh, let me explain a little bit about where I went. So I'm from an upper middle class family in, in outside of Memphis. South Memphis is not that. Um, it's a little rough. I don't know if, well, it, it's just rough. Uh, but this place called Harbor House is a nonprofit treatment center for men 
uh, that takes people without insurance. And I didn't have any insurance. I didn't have any money. Some of these facilities, if you've ever priced them, they're twenty, thirty thousand dollars for thirty days. I had zero, so um, that's where I went, and that once again was God doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. And so, part of that story is the intake coordinator and, and this guy were, were friends, and a guy did not show up to treatment that day, the the day that I was in the driveway. He didn't show up, so there was a bed available at a facility that normally has a wait list. Once again, God, right? When I tell that story, though, I always wonder, you know, what what happened to that guy? Why me? I don't know. I pray he's still alive, you know? But uh, but I went, and uh, it was a 30-day treatment center. I knew 30 days wasn't enough for me. Uh, they had a little sober living house uh, next door. But on that first on that first day, I'm gonna get to that sober living part. On the first uh, day, it was really hard. The second day uh, was even tougher. Uh, my mind was telling me to to get out of here, and my childhood home pastor shows up. The pastor at the time at, at Holly Grove Cumberland Presbyterian Church, he showed up, Brother Ron McMillan, and uh, and that was the only people that could visit you during the first week was your pastor, and uh, he, <laughs> I got to tell this story, um, in order to have a visitor, you have to sit through an AA meeting, uh, and so during the AA meeting, there's a speaker, and this speaker was the worst potty mouth you'd ever heard. Like, he was saying all the words, even the one word you're really not supposed to say where you, you know, make fun of him. I'm just saying. I can't say it, but y'all know what I'm word I'm talking about. And I look over at my preacher, and he's just over there laughing. He's like, yeah. and I said, man, did, at the end of that, he said, did you hear this guy's potty mouth? And the preacher's like, you know, that's his story, bro. That's his story. That's the way he tells it. And sometimes that's the way he connected with people. And he probably did. You know, there's people in treatment centers that, y'all, they ain't walk, never step foot in a church. We were talking about this last night. Is this welcoming church? My church, we, we claimed ourselves the church for the unchurched. People who had given up on God, but not necessarily, or given up on church, but not necessarily given up on God. And I, to this day, it, it makes me think about that. And I work in mental health now. I work with people who have trauma and work with all the, these, these folks. And, man, there's, there's some hurt people out there, y'all. And some of them have been hurt. I don't believe it's by the church. It's people. People hurt people, right? But we've got to figure out ways to get them back in here, get them back. And right, what happened in that parking lot yesterday is the way to do it, one of the ways, one of the ways to do it. So, um, so anyway, at the end of that speaker, me and him go over to a little seat, and uh, he just, it's its so cliche, preachers do it all the time, right, but he asked me, he says, Ben, have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior into your heart? I was like, yeah, I think, I mean, yeah, I've raised my hand and did all the things, I, w- I was drugged to a, a massive church when I was a kid by my mom. And she's like, you're going to go up there, and you're going to do this, and you're going to go up in that huge swimming, swimming pool they got up there, and you're going to go under the water, and you're going to do all this. And so I was like, okay, okay, I'll do it. I didn't feel it, y'all. I didn't feel it. But that right there on the floor of that treatment center was the day I accepted Jesus back into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. <laughs> And my life has never been the same since. That was over 14 years ago. Um, that's the first time I felt it. You know, that's the first time that I really felt Jesus Christ doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. And so I, I graduated that program. They had a sober living house uh, next door. I moved in there. The very first weekend, uh, my brother, the older brother who took me to treatment, he invited me to church. Uh, once again, this whole welcoming thing, I, guys, I did not feel, I was still, I was only 30 days sober. I was not, I don't know, I don't know what I was. I was still broken. I know that. 
I didn't feel, didn't feel something, didn't feel safe, and I'd had, I'd had a weird experience with a mega church, and uh, I was, I don't know, I just didn't feel comfortable, but I didn't have any clothes that were nice, all my clothes were something, and uh, didn't matter, didn't matter, so he picked me up, and we went to this church called Hope, Hope Church in Memphis, it's a Cumberland, or a Evangelical Presbyterian Church, but it's the largest EPC church in America. It's pretty big. Um, but from the time we got out of his truck to the time we walked into the sanctuary, where's my greeters at? Who are my greeters? Who likes to greet? Don't know y'all like to greet people? Y'all better be welcoming these folks up in here. <laughs> so from the moment I walk, or moment I stepped out of my brother's truck, six people looked me square in the eye and said, welcome to Hope. We're glad you're here. If you've ever greeted somebody at your church, thank you. You have no idea what you're doing sometimes. Just like what happened in that parking lot. We don't know. We don't know the blessings we're doing today. But one day, you know, somebody will be standing on the stage saying thank you. And you'll never know what you did. But just welcoming, just getting the, getting these people that don't walk in here all the time to feel at home, man, it's huge. And that's what happened. That huge church became so small to me, and I actually felt it. And so um, it was an amazing service. The preacher, oh, my gosh, the worship, I was crying. I mean, it was horrible. And then the preacher just gets up there, and he starts talking about addiction. I'm like, whoa, bro, I'm from, I'm, you don't talk about this in the Cumberland Presbyterian. and, you know, you kind of cover that up. We didn't, but, but I was like, this once again was Jesus telling me, man, you're home. You are here. This is it. And I plugged in. Man, that church, I plugged into that church so hard. I, I, I was there every day. The door was open. I, be, I started doing the kitchen ministry. They had a scrubs ministry where we cleaned the church because it's a massive facility. It's two hours a day. You get to go up there and just pick a, pick a duty and clean your church so we didn't have to hire cleaning staff. That saved, that, I think it was $300,000 a year is what it saved the church to do. And we give all that money to missions. Uh, just by having volunteers clean the church. Um, yeah, so there was just so many ministries. And then I started getting involved with the global ministry. So I, I, I was twice now, I've been able to go to Africa and share my story uh, of recovery. And that's, man, that's, that's God, right? I shared my story with a group of kids whose parents were in prison in Uganda. And, oh, man, I'm just... Every day, I mean, I pinch myself uh, about what God has done in my life. And and um, I stayed in that sober living house for two years, and I got, I got my life back together. You know, that's what it took. About a year into it, I, I told you I had a sister. Uh, my sister stayed out there a little bit longer. You know, we both got in trouble at the same time, but she stayed out there a little bit longer, and, and I understand uh, but she got in trouble one more time, and her probation officer said, you're, you're either going to go to treatment or you're going to go to prison for about eight years. She's like, mm, I think I'll go to treatment. <laughs> That's a great idea. And, uh, and so she calls me up and says, hey, you know, I see what God's doing in your life. She didn't say that, but, you know, you could tell. She was talking it. She just, I can see it's working, you know. And she said, I'm ready. And I had a treatment center list uh, of phone numbers, and I said, all right. I could have called one of them, too. You know, I probably could have called one of them and got her a bed. But I said, I want you to call them every day until bed opens up. She, she had to call them for two days, and one finally took her Memphis Recovery Center, another facility that doesn't, that takes people without insurance. And uh, and she went, and she's been sober for about 13 years, and I've been sober for 14. So, and she's, it's, thank you. It's she's older than me. <clears throat> she's older than me, but I got more years in recovery, so it's fine. It's always a competition. It's got to be. I'm sorry. I know you're not supposed to brag about how many years, but whatever. Um, but that's once again, that's God. Uh, for the past seven or eight years, me and my dad, my poor father, who we put through, whew, I don't want to even say the word, um, has both of his children back. 
and he he just couldn't be more proud and be more blessed and uh ah, he's just he's so happy he comes to our birthdays and just cries like a baby um this see my big strong strong dad over there crying because we're picking up going say dad stop but he's proud of us right uh i want to give a shout out to all those grandparents out there who are raising kids because of addiction I saw him walking. I saw him yesterday. You can tell sometimes. God bless grandparents. I don't have mine anymore. And uh, that's, that's one of the hardest. That's one of the hardest things for me is my grandmother didn't get to see. She didn't get to see me today. I mean, I know she's looking down, but I... Uh, I made some horrible mistakes growing up, and, and so I try today uh, to continue to do the right thing, but I'm, I'm a sinner. I'm broken still, uh, but every day I try to wake up, you know, and invite God in to my day, and uh, it just seems to work, so I, uh, about a few years, I had started working jobs after I got sober, and I, I realized that this is not what God wants me to do. And one night, a friend of mine reached out to me on social media, and I promised the Donahoe's I would get us out of here on time. So, <laughs> kidding, kidding. Um, but I, um, I knew I wasn't doing God's work. And I had a Facebook message from somebody saying they were going to kill themselves. And I said, well, don't do that. Uh, let Meet me at, there's a place called Lakeside in Memphis. I said, won't you meet me at Lakeside? And I showed up there, and there was a person who had a gun, uh, and they were in a car. And I got in the car with them, and I talked to them for two hours. And I talked them into going, going walking inside. Lakeside's a, a large 400-bed acute care hospital. They psych and mental health and addiction, everything. They treat everything. I said, why don't you go in there? Why don't you walk in and just talk to these people? And that's what they did. And... Uh, and they ended up getting admitted. And I remember going home that night and praying to God. I was like, God, that, that something about that, that, that felt good, you know. It was absolutely horrifying, but it was also something that just, it gave me peace, right? Talking to somebody out of, off the ledge, how, how in the world that gives you peace, I don't know, but it did me. And, uh, and so, I mean, not even a day or two later, I get a phone call from a lady I met one time. She said, hey, I don't know what it is, but I think you'd be good at working for this treatment center. I was like, are you kidding me? Like, and then I told her the story about what had happened a couple of days ago. Once again, that's God doing what he thinks I need to be doing, right? And so uh, I went and interviewed for that job. First of all, I have not interviewed for a job at that time in ever, ever. I was a nightclub DJ. Like, that didn't really take an interview, you know what I mean? So, um but I bombed. I was terrible at the interview. But she, and she said, and it was for marketing is what it was for. And I was like, mm, I can't sell stuff. My mom sold Mary Kay, but, yeah, I, I didn't, the apple did not fall from that tree. Uh, and so, and it's funny because now I do marketing. But um, at the time I didn't. And she said, you, you're not very good at marketing, but you'd be really good at crisis. That's going out and meeting people and talking them into going to treatment. I was like, mm, yep, see, that's what I need to be doing. Well, that job's not available, but two days later, they fired that girl and hired me. So, uh, <coughs> she wasn't very good. It's fine. <laughs> Sorry. I hope she landed on her feet. Um, but for, for, in, for a year and a half, I met people. I went out into the community. I went to jails. I went to houses. I went to coffee shops, I talked to families, I did whatever it took to talk to the loved one, to, to talk to the addict or the loved one or whatever it took to get these people help, to get these people into treatment. Exactly what was done for me. Paid it back tenfold. And I got really good at it. Um, there is a little bit, uh, I don't want to, if there's anybody struggling here, you ever, you ever get an intervention done on you? There's a little bit of manipulation that has to be done, but it's fine. We're saving your life, so just don't freak out. Um, but it's, it's, it's one of the most fulfilling jobs ever, and I've been doing it for over 10 years now. Literally, 
giving back what was so freely given to me, just talking to people and talking them and going to treatment and educating, educating families on what not to do. Stop paying their phone bills. Stop paying the bill. You know what I mean? Like there's a lot of stuff that we all, those of us who've lived it, we've got to stop doing. Um, and I tell, I have to tell these families, I have to get real honest with them. And some families do not want to hear it. But I know what I put my father through. My father is the poster child for what not to do. He loved us, though. That's the thing. You know, he loved me so much that, and I could manipulate him in any way I could. And I'm still paying, I'm still paying him back, you know, just trying to do everything I can to let him know. Just what an amazing dad he really was. And I don't ever take advantage of him again, you know. So uh, I do borrow his truck from time to time, and every time I scratch it. So, <sighs> man, I took it to Nashville and put a big old dent. He'd only had it for like a month. Mm. Sorry, Dad. But uh, but no, it's he, he's got his children back, and he's so grateful. That That childhood home that was quarantined, it's not in our family anymore, but you know what? If I want that house back so bad, I'll go buy it, you know? I'm at a place in my life where if I want that, well, I don't have to get a loan, but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but that's how I feel. That's how I look at life today. I, didn't, I have not lost anything. I've gained everything. I gained it all. So I... Uh, Every day, every single day of my life, my life gets better. I uh, putting people in treatment, working in a treatment center uh, field has has been just the greatest gift to anybody. Uh, it's just a, it's just a gift. It is an absolute gift. I do it for free, but I can't. I have to I have to pay bills. Um, but it's just it's amazing. And that church, uh, I just got voted in to be the ambassador to Uganda. For, for my church and for the uh, the global ministry, I'm planning on going back there next year, uh, and just continuing continuing to show the love of Jesus Christ through through my actions. I feel like I I, uh, I said earlier I, I come across a lot of people with a lot of hurt, a lot of pain, a lot of of trauma, uh, and some of it some of it is is because of of, of some religious trauma, and. I can't, I can't preach to these people. It don't work, you know. But I can be the message, you know. Be the message. Don't preach. Not everybody needs to be preached to. Some people just need to be loved on. And uh, and I've I've learned that over the years. You know, I uh, I can't beat somebody over the head with a Bible. I wish I wish I could. Wish it worked, but it don't. You know, and so. I have to ease into folks. You know, the treatment center I work for now, we have a church service on Sunday, on Sunday nights, and it's not mandatory, uh, but it's you'd be amazed how many people trickle in. And so my church has an amazing recovery and support ministry. We have we host all the meetings, recovery meetings. We host about, I don't know, 20 of them. And we're talking about all of them, too. The ones that we don't really want to talk about in church, sex addiction, we, we have a men's sex addiction group. We have Sexaholics Anonymous. We have Suicide Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, Naranon, Alanon, Alateen. Um, oh, man, I don't even know the rest of them. Oh, Hope for Women in Controlling Relationships. Uh, it's very high security. You've got to sign up for that one. Um, and just, just all of these support groups. And I get to go make the coffee on Sunday nights. So we give all the coffee to these folks. And so that's just another thing that... that you know, as a church that we get to do to love on people who who are just ready to give up, you know. And um, and those folks trickle out of those meetings. We don't do CR. I know some of you know the Celebrate Recovery model. We don't have those meetings, but we, we direct people to them. There's some other churches around us that do it. But what's happened over the years is all those people that go to those meetings trickle out of those meetings, and they come to church without even inviting them. Sometimes they just like, mm, this church looks cool. Let's go. And that's what happens. And then we became known as a kind of like a little recovery church, but it's big. You know, the sanctuary seats 5,000 people. And every given Sunday, there's, I don't know, hundreds, hundreds of people that are in long term recovery going to that church. So super grateful for it. Uh, we just hired a new pastor. I'm super, 
I love him to death. He's from Texas, but uh, and he's the very first African American ordained evangelical Presbyterian pastor. And we were a ninety something percent all white church, and now we're multi ethnic, multicultural, multi everything because of him. His love for God, his love to diver- diversify our church has just been amazing. I'm so grateful for it. That's something that I've tried to dedicate my life to. There's, if you look around, you go to treatment centers, or it's, it's, it's not a lot of culture. It's, you know, the white folks seem to be the only people getting help. And we know everybody struggles, right? The disease of addiction does not discriminate. So trying to get into those inner city communities in Memphis has been something I've been trying to do. It's hard. It's really hard. So uh, it's a lot of cultural, a lot of uh, cultural stuff that needs to happen just to, to lessen the stigma of addiction. Guys, it's, it's, it's a disease. I hope everybody in here believes that. I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but it is a disease, but it's absolutely treatable. And, you know, I had to hit rock bottom to discover that God was that rock at the bottom. And from that day forward, from accepting Jesus back into my life to going to treatment, to working in treatment, to doing all this, that's, that's why I have 14 years of recovery. I want to close uh, first I just want to, I want to pray because I feel like somebody in here is struggling or you know somebody that is. Can we pray for a second? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you so much for all the blessings you've given us. God, I feel I feel a heaviness in the room today. I don't know what it is. I don't know who it is. But God, please, please reach down and touch those people. God, you saved me, and I know you can save them. That family member that's out there today, you don't know where they are. God, you do. You know exactly where they are. They don't have the words to talk to you right now, but you you have the power to reach down today and save their life. Families, God loves y'all more than anything in this world. I know you you may be taking care of some kids right now that belong to your children because of an addiction. And that's that's one of the hardest things that I see on a daily basis is those those children who had absolutely nothing to do with it. God loves them so much, and God loves you. Thank you. Thank you so much for stepping up and, and being that parent. I don't know, God. Just, just thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Highland Assembly, for what you all do here. That's the reason I'm here. I'll come back to this church every year. Uh, so... Anyway, I just needed to pray that prayer, God. So thank you so much for all that you do. Amen. And I want to leave you with this Bible verse that I always do when I share my story. It's Philippians 3, 12 through 14, pressing toward the goal. I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it.